In the previous session, we spent a great deal of time discussing the muscles of the hand and the mechanics of hand motion. We conclude our sessions of the upper limb with a look at the neurovascular components of the hand. Welcome back. Having placed all the bones and muscles in place, we conclude our journey of the upper limb by looking at the terminal points of the arteries and the nerves that have, for the most part, already been introduced. We'll also consider some surface anatomy and, of course, a few more clinical. Welcome back. Having placed all the bones and muscles in place, we can. Welcome back. Having placed all the bones and muscles in place, we conclude our journey of the upper limb by looking at the terminal points of the arteries and the nerves that have, for the most part, already been introduced. We'll also consider some surface anatomy and, of course, a few more clinical correlations to round it all off. The principal blood supply is from the radial and ulnar arteries. Tracing the radial artery at the wrist, it divides to provide an anterior division that passes deep to the thenar muscles to provide a minor contribution to the superficial palmar arch. The posterior division passes through the previously described anatomical snuff box. Either anterior or posterior divisions can give off the radialis indices branch to the lateral aspect of the index finger and the princeps pollicis branch to the thumb. The deep portion provides the principal contribution to the deep palmar arch, supplying the deeper structures of the hand. The ulnar artery enters the hand under the palmar carpal ligament and passes just lateral to the pisiform and hook of the hammy. It provides the main contribution to the superficial palmar arch. Off of the palmar arch are a series of common digital arteries that project superiorly towards the webbing between each digit. Each splits forming the proper digital branches that project distally as the principal vascular supply to each of these digits. The smaller division of the ulnar artery dives between the central and hypothenar compartments to anastomose with the much larger radial contribution. These structures represent the distalmost portion of vascular supply to the hand. A common easy test of vascular supply to the upper limb is the capillary refill test. It's a simple matter of squeezing the blood from the capillary network underneath the nail bed by pinching the finger. As a result, the tissue blanches white but quickly regains its color after a brief period. Delays in this refill often indicate vascular compromise. One example of vascular compromise is seen with Raynaud syndrome, an idiopathic ischemia of the digital arteries due to excessive vascular spasm, commonly in response to cold or stress. The condition results in pain and paresthesia and is accompanied with the blanching of the affected tissue. We conclude by looking at the nerve supply to the hand. As previously observed, the median nerve passes deep to the carpal tunnel, where it is commonly compressed in carpal tunnel syndrome. As it emerges from underneath the tunnel, it provides the recurrent branches to the thenar eminence. The remainder of the nerve projects forward as the common digital branches, similar to the common digital arteries that they run with. From here, they provide motor branches to the two lumbrical muscles before splitting into the proper digital branches to project up either side of digits 1, 2, 3, and the lateral half of 4. The ulnar nerve passes into the wrist deep to the palmar carpal ligament, but superficial to the carpal tunnel. Consequently, it is not affected by carpal tunnel syndrome the same way that the median nerve is. It laces its way between the pisiform and hamate hook deep to the palmaris brevis muscle in a region known as the ulnar tunnel or Guillain's canal. From here, the nerve gives off a common digital branch similar to that for the median nerve. The common digital branch supplies the medial two lumbricals before branching to give the proper digital branches to the medial aspect of the fourth digit and the lateral aspect of the fifth digit. An additional proper branch supplies the medial aspect of the fifth digit. Additionally, a deep branch supplies motor branches to the hypothenar muscles before diving deep to supply motor branches to the interossei, abductor pollicis, and the medial head of flexor pollicis brevis. Just a reminder that the radial nerve supplies no motor branches to the muscular compartments of the hand. 
Instead, there is a single superficial branch that supplies innervation to the skin over the thumb. For this reason, among others, there are no dorsal intrinsic muscles of the hand to consider. Even the dorsal interossei are considered part of the palmar compartment. Again, just a reminder of the cutaneous nerve supply to the hand, which is important in confirming the presence of various neuropathies. Note especially that because of the branching patterns of the median and ulnar nerve, the medial aspect of the fourth digit is supplied by the ulnar nerve, while the lateral half is supplied by the median nerve. This becomes important in diagnosing peripheral neuropathies. The patient will likely complain about paresthesia over the medial lateral aspect of the fourth digit exclusively, while isolated injuries of the ulnar or median nerve, respectively. You can even observe this on yourself the next time you bump your funny bone. Only the medial side of your ring finger will tingle. We mentioned a number of surface anatomy structures during the lecture, but review them in this final slide. The three most important are the thenar and hypothenar eminences containing the associated musculature and the anatomical snuff box just distal to the wrist. Also note the fleshy appearance of the webbing between the first and second digits. This contains both the abductor pollicis and the first dorsal interossei muscles, which adduct and abduct the index finger. Both muscles contract strongly when pinching an object between the first and second digits, the so-called key grip position, and can be palpated as they do so. That concludes our discussion of the hand, and our discussion of the upper limb for that matter. In the next lesson, we dive straight into the lower limb, discussing its articulation with the axial skeleton at the hip and the different compartments of the thigh. Until that time, this has been Dr. Stuart Ingalls. Enjoy the rest of your day.